context, we can stand praising instead of fleeing and asking for rocks and hills to fall upon us. Uh, I just love that. And really, there's a direct line away from those pictures, those uh, mental pictures, and this whole discussion of the life of the church that we've been uh, looking at and, and working on in Romans chapter 12. Because it's in the context of the church's fellowship, just a quick reference to Ephesians 4, that with every part supplying what it has been given, the body works together to build itself up in love. It's the same process as being washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. It's the same thing. It's, it's God is bringing this about through our fellowship together. Now let's just, just review re real quickly uh, the key points we've learned so far from this 12th chapter of Romans. First thing is that the life of the church and our whole experience as members in the church is rooted in mercy. Rooted in mercy. We're all here with the consciousness that it's by grace alone that we've been brought into this family. Not deserving, not worthy. We didn't come in because our garments were white and, and clean and without any spot or wrinkle. No, vagabonds off the street. He put his hand on us. He brought us in. We're here by mercy. We are a people of God by mercy. We also saw that uh, we are one another. We're not just individuals just with solo relationships, just God and me alone or God and you alone. We saw that it's all of us together with God. We are one another, Paul says, members one of another. We've also seen that all of us have been given a spiritual gift. We've been given some capacity, some ability by the Holy Spirit by which we can serve each other and help each other. And we saw last week that we come to recognize our gift and to hone it and sharpen it and, and strengthen it by making a strong commitment to the community. You'll never find your gift or develop it or or see it fruitful for the Lord, unless you have made a very strong commitment that group of people is family. I need them, they also need me. It's in the context of such a commitment that we come to see God has equipped me with something. So we find both a sense of belonging, and we also find this sense that I belong, but I also have something valuable to contribute. Really beautiful picture. And within the context of that community, the Holy Spirit begins to sensitize us to the various needs that are present. And that in itself begins to lead each of us to discover exactly what He would have us contribute. We become sensitive to different kinds of needs. And so He guides us and he teaches us in this way. So we talked about needs last week and being sensitive to the needs of the present. But I also said right at the end of last week's sermon that we need to work a bit on understanding just how is it that the Holy Spirit works. And that's what we want to work on today. How is it that the Holy Spirit goes about his task of building up the church? I want to work on that by making three different observations. So I'm going to list them out here and then we'll work through them one by one. Here's the three observations. The Holy Spirit works by and through the gifts. He works by and through the gifts. Second observation, the gifts are a clue 
to his primary concerns. The gifts are a clue to his primary concerns, the things that he's aiming at as he goes about his work. And then the third observation that I want to make is that the power, you know, we know the Holy Spirit is a being of great power. When you look at the book of Acts, there's evidence of great power. Paul speaks of great power. But we want to observe and think about a bit at the, towards the end of the, our time together. We want to think about the fact that the power is not always most evident in the individual actions, but rather in the cumulative effect. Now, I use big words to say that. We'll unpack that later. Not always in individual actions, but rather in the cumulative effect. So, those three things. We're going to work on those three observations. Number one, he works by the gifts. Now, who possesses the gifts? Who is it that is said to have the gift? Is, is it the Holy Spirit that has the gift, or is it people in the community, in the body who have, have the gifts. It's people, isn't it? That's what we said. We've each been given a gift. But the Holy Spirit works by these gifts, and this is astounding to me. It's really astounding. God's way of working. He doesn't stride into the room and say, well, all the rest of you, you know, just sit down, get over, get out of the way, get over on the side. I've showed up, and here, I'll get the things done that need to be done. No, no, you, you look through the whole of human history. And every time God moves, there's one of his human creatures involved, isn't there? Every single time. God is not into solo actions. He, he works indirectly. He works through. He works through his creatures. He works in cooperation with. And so every time you see the Holy Spirit working in the scripture, you take the book of Acts, for example. You read through the book of Acts, and every time the Holy Spirit is moving with power, there is a human instrument. There is what Paul calls a vessel. He's working through. He doesn't work directly. He works through. And as you think about this, you actually begin to realize that it brings God great delight to see his spirit enlivening and moving through the lives of his children brings him great delight when he sees his spirit in you moving through you to do beautiful things It actually brings God a great deal more delight doing it that way than if he had just done it by himself. Now, parents can relate to this. You know, when your children are quite small, it actually, to get some task done, it actually slows you down to involve them, doesn't it? It's more work to have them help you than if you just did the thing by yourself. And so there's that stage where, where it actually seems less effective, less certainly less efficient to draw the little ones in and, and have them engage with you in, in whatever task that you're working. But a good parent, nonetheless, accepts the inefficiency and draws the little ones in, don't they? 
And even when the little one struggles, you know, you, you show them, you do like this and you'll do some particular thing. Even when the little one struggles and has a hard time doing that, a good parent doesn't just take it away from them. He says, well, now let me show you one more time. He may demonstrate again, but then he gives it right back and says, okay, you try again. You try again. And oh, the joy in a parent's heart. When the child has grown up and matured, and what the parent desires to be done, he sees, he or she sees the child doing with efficiency and skill and power. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? I was just up at Greeley Hill again the last couple of days. And uh, when I drive into my mom's place, the driveway comes kind of slightly down the hill and then comes around the house and as I drove in, I looked over to the right. Four cords of wood. Split and stacked. Beautifully stacked. Over there on the right. And then as you come down around the bottom of the house, at least another cord stacked over here on the left of the driveway. And my mind went back to just a few years ago when I said to Morgan one one uh, spring morning. I said, Morgan, you want to try splitting wood with me? It wasn't real easy at the start, was it, Morgan? It was hard to swing that ball. We were splitting by hand. We weren't using a splitter. Now, this year she used a splitter. Um, so it was a little bit easier. But there's, there's joy in a parent's heart to see the child doing important vital tasks through the education and empowerment of the parent. So God is this way. He has great delight in seeing us do the tasks through His empowerment, through, through His Holy Spirit filling us, seeing us do the tasks that are closest to His own heart. Not only that, working together, God and us, God has joy, and the creature has significance and the joy of being with God in the things that God is doing. Can you imagine any greater joy than to be partnered together with God, doing the things that are vital and important to him and seeing those things realized in the world. It's a broken world we live in. But God wants to fill us and move through us in ways that we actually see little plantings of the kingdom of heaven taking root in others' lives and growing and maturing and developing and he gives the gifts so that that can So there it is, the, the first uh, observation is that the Holy Spirit works through the gifts. He doesn't work independent. He doesn't move on his own. He works through. He works through us. It's astounding. It's really awe-inspiring that, that he wants to work through us. The greatest power in all the universe wants to work through us. Second observation, the gifts are clues, they are clues as to the Spirit's primary concerns in the world. What do I mean by that? Well, as we pay attention, as we pay attention to the lists that we have, there are various lists in the New Testament, we're going to look at those in just a moment. But as we pay attention to those lists, we begin to notice certain things. 
Now the lists are found in uh, three different letters of Paul. It's actually a delineation of the lists. They're mentioned in other books as well, and you see evidence of them in other books. But they're found in three different letters. You have in Romans 12 a list, and that's what we've been working on. In Ephesians 4, you have yet another list. And then in the first, uh, in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, you have two lists, as it were. Paul is illustrating, and he mentions quite a few of the gifts, and then at the end of that passage, he reiterates them again. So you have 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10, and 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. So you have these lists of gifts. But what do we notice as we begin to pay attention to these lists? I've got them all listed out here so that I can access them real quickly. Uh, you might want to look yourself in the various passages, but let's just begin observing here one thing. One thing uh, we notice as we begin looking at this, the various gifts, is that many of them have to do with insight and understanding and wisdom and truth. Let me, let me illustrate that. Look, look for example, the gifts, the, the list we have in Romans 12. The first that is listed there is prophecy. What is the function of prophecy? Well, it's to bring insight into the truth, to reveal God's mind, to reveal God's heart here in the world where those things have been lost sight of. So we have this emphasis on, on insight and wisdom, understanding. Prophecy, And then you come down uh, a couple gifts later and Paul mentions teaching. Well, what's the function of teaching? Teaching is, is, is that thing that we do to communicate insight. To bring insight to bear in, in someone's life. You have another gift here. I, I'm not sure where to put this one exhortation. Somewhat related to these gifts of teaching and, and prophecy, but uh, also a little later we'll consider whether it might also fit better in another category that we'll see. We go down to the list in Ephesians 4 and we have apostles. Apostles, those who are sent with a message. You see here the emphasis again on insight and wisdom and, and, and truth being communicated. We have apostles and prophets in Ephesians 4 and evangelists uh, and teachers. You see this emphasis on that which is communicated, the truth which is communicated. The list in 1 Corinthians 12, the first list, verses 8 through 10, Paul speaks of a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. I think I've said enough here. You see you see these gifts that are all focused around the human need for insight and understanding. The human need for wisdom. We live in a context where spiritually we have become blind. Spiritually we're confused. Spiritually we can't see the proper path often that we should go down. And so one of the Holy Spirit's primary concerns as he moves through the gifts and the life of the community together is he doesn't want a community where there's, there's indecision and lack of clarity and uh, muddy thinking and, and spiritual darkness uh, be clouding our eyes. He wants a community in which the truth is, is revealed and shines brightly and and, and that there's a clear distinction between what is God's path and what is not. This insight and this wisdom that comes through these different gifts, prophecy and teaching and, and uh, exhortation and, and words of wisdom. And the Holy Spirit wants a community that's full of light and truth. Because truth provides us in our living with the only solid place to stand. That's what the, the truth, the, the word translated truth 
from the Hebrew Bible actually means the firm place. The place where it's not quicksand and, and soft and give way. And it's the firm place. Emunah, the truth. The place where the, the foundation is solid. And so we see here in the gifts that Paul lists that one of the primary concerns is that we should have our eyes wide open spiritually. That we should see clearly. And so the gifts are given. This is one of the Spirit's concerns. That we see clearly. That our thinking and our understanding and our outlook on life not be muddied by the sin problem and by the rebellion that exists in our world against God and His ways. So we see that concern. But then there's, there's another area of concern that, that we also see in and we might call these gifts the action gifts. The action gifts. Because they don't have so much to do with communication and with words. But they have to do with acts of service. Gifts of service. Actions that meet concrete needs. You know, again, our world is is uh, full of brokenness, full of need. Even our lives as Christians, it's not that the moment you become a Christian and put your faith in Christ, that uh, you're all of a sudden completely whole with no, with no difficulties or challenges or needs. And so not just the world, but the church, the church is full of needs. And so we have, we have another whole list of gifts that relate to the needs that are in the world. Let's pick those out a bit. Looking in the Romans 12 passage, here we find uh, Paul mentions giving, giving with liberality. It's a concrete need. Someone's hungry. Someone is coming to financial difficulty. And Paul says there's a spiritual gift in the church, the person who loves to give. With a wide open heart. Is meeting that concrete need. So it's an action gift. Look at a little lower. And, and there's this word. Paul says that one of the gifts is mercy. Someone whose heart is. Wide open. Compassionate. Towards someone who's struggling. Or in need. We can put that, I'll jump down here to the 1 Corinthians 12, 28 list. I think this word mercy goes really well together with another word that uh, we simply translate helps. One of the spiritual gifts is helps. Well, what does Paul mean by that? It's a picture of grabbing hold of someone, of taking hold of someone. That's from the Greek word to take. Lambano. And, and this is a derivation of that to take hold of someone. And the picture I see is if someone is sinking, if someone is sinking down under, under some weight or burden or difficulty and they're sinking down, or maybe it's a problem with an addiction or, or, or habit patterns that maybe even re in response to financial financial means and so forth. You know, some people, some of us haven't learned how to manage money very well. And, and, and you find yourself sinking down. Well, the person with the gift of helps and mercy, instead of coming along and giving you a lecture from the bank, reaches down, takes a hold of you and says, brother, sister, let me lift you back. You see these action gifts. Giving, mercy. Ephesians 4, Paul says, works of service. Uh, there's needs that are involved with uh, sickness and, and the loss of health. And so Paul talks about healing gifts. So you have these, these, this cluster of gifts that meets concrete needs. Okay, so let's just keep in mind here. We see that the Holy Spirit is very concerned about truth and that we have clear insight. 
but he's also very concerned that the concrete and real life needs of people get met. And so he equips the community, he equips the body with gifts that take care of both of those concerns. And then finally, our third observation, and here are these the power of the Holy Spirit's work, not necessarily seen most in individual acts or works, but in the cumulative effect of all the gifts working together. Now, why should this observation be made? Why is it even important? Well, it's for this reason. That because we've been affected by the fall, because sin has affected our way of thinking and, and feeling, we tend to be impressed by the wrong thing. We tend to be impressed by the wrong things. We tend to look for the wrong things. And so when this whole subject of the Holy Spirit comes up, we have a tendency to constantly be yearning and looking for the dramatic and the impressive. Oh, the Holy Spirit. We want to feel gales of power moving through the room. We want to feel profound emotions. We want to see mighty miracles. We want evidence that God is moving and active. Now, God does move in all those ways at times, doesn't he? He has moved in the ways that I just described. He does do that at times. But if we're not careful, and I'm saying this because I think our age right now, you look at evangelical churches, you look in the Catholic Church, you look at Christendom in general, we tend to be over-impressed by the dramatic, by the impressive. And when we think of the Holy Spirit, it's, we've come to such a pass of things in, in Christendom in general that our primary thought when we think of the Holy Spirit is phenomena. Things happening that are impressive and obviously supernatural. And our minds tend to go there. And in fact, as I reflected on this last year, maybe two years ago, I was at Greeley Hill and I was preaching on 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And as I reflected on it, I realized that the primary work of the Holy Spirit in this emphasis upon impressive phenomena. I know it's not in the Adventist church, but in many churches, the Holy Spirit, you talk about the Holy Spirit, and the first thing that is thought of is tongues, speaking in tongues. Or the gift of healing. These are the power gifts. There, there's a whole church denomination, the Vineyard Fellowship, that was started by a man, a man named John Wimper because he said, the church has, doesn't have these gifts anymore. We need these gifts. We should still have them. This tremendous emphasis develop upon gifts of obvious power. And so that's the context in, in which we find ourselves in this time in history. Like I said, God does indeed move at times in some very impressive ways. You think of the early church with the healings and the miracles. You take a handkerchief that Paul had had in his pocket and you take it and other people touch it and they're healed. So God has moved in these ways at certain times. You think of some of the stories from the early Advent movement. Ellen White's experience of vision and prophecy and the Holy Spirit moving in tangible power into the places where they were meeting and praying. You think of the healings they saw as different people who were preaching and teaching and, and working for God's kingdom would be struck down with sickness and how they pray until those people were raised up. And so God does work in these ways. 
But again, something goes wrong in our human spirits when we begin to make a desire for such evident power our primary interest. We need to remember also that God just as often, maybe even more often, yes, I think we can say that, if you looked at the whole of human history and you looked at those times where there was great power and miracles, it's primarily in the exodus from Egypt and the first coming of Christ and the aftermath short, shortly thereafter, the beginning of the apostles' work. Primarily just those two junctures. Now there's miracles in the work of Elisha. There's miracles, you know, here and there in the history of Israel. But most of the time in God's working within human history, you don't see the impressive and the dramatic, do you? Oh, but God does work we need to remember that God also moves in silent, hidden ways that are no less significant and perhaps maybe even more significant. I think of one of my favorite lines from the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. He says, and I'm not quoting exactly, but this is the idea. He says, God veins small Violets and makes tall trees more and more. Can you see him doing that? Can you see God veining the violet? Is it dramatic and powerful and shouting in your face as he veins small violets? Or can you see him growing the tree? You know, look at those mighty sequoias just up the slope. So beautiful, so powerful. Can you see them growing? They've grown, haven't they? But you're never going to see it happen. So God, God just as often, and maybe even more often, works in silent, hidden ways. And that's important for us to remember. Lest we hunger too much for the dramatic and miss the thing he's seeking to do with us in the less dramatic times and ways. I had a friend in, in Groveland. And somehow he had started coming to the Adventist Church. And he had been a member in one of John Wimber's uh, Vineyard Fellowship churches. And Jim could talk about nothing but power gifts. He was always talking about visionary experiences and, and powerful moments of healing and so forth. And I used to say to him on a regular basis, we'd be chatting after church or something, and he'd be talking about these things again. And, and I'd look at him and I'd say, Jim, what is the miracle of the Holy Spirit? What is the greatest miracle? And he kind of looked puzzled at me. And then I it's the transformation of the human heart. Transformation of the human heart. That's the Holy Spirit's greatest miracle. Much greater miracle than parting the Red Sea. Much greater miracle than slaying the whole Assyrian army. Much greater miracle is the transformation of the human heart. So that a heart that is dirty and corrupted and bent the wrong way becomes a heart and holy and full of love for truth and beauty and wisdom as they come from God. Transformation of the human heart. It's the Holy Spirit's greatest miracle. And so I say that the thing we should be looking for most when we think of the Holy Spirit is the cumulative effect of his work in human hearts through the gifts. And what is that cumulative effect of his work? What do we call it? 
when he has worked profoundly and changed a human heart? What is the fruit of that? What is the result of that? It's love. The greatest sign of the Holy Spirit's work and presence is a profound and deep love flowing between each and every member of his body. We see that in the Romans 12 passage. Paul ends the whole discussion of gifts by saying, be devoted to one another in love. As these gifts are exercised, teaching, preaching, explanation of the word of prophecy, at certain junctures in history, the prophetic gift itself, helps, encouragement, Oh, I forgot. There's a whole third category of gifts. I forgot it, but and I'll just mention it. We won't go into it a lot right now. But there's the gift of administration, of leadership, of bringing order and efficiency to the work and movement of God's people. It's another set of gifts of Paul. But as these gifts are exercised, no single act of the exercise of a spiritual gift may be flamboyant and impressive and loud and, and with all kinds of bells and whistles. No, the acts may seem simple and quiet and human, but the Holy Spirit is moving through them. And as He moves through the exercise of these gifts, the cumulative effect in the body of Christ is the creation of a community chapter of 1 Corinthians. It's significant that that 13th chapter is the clearest, most definitive definition of love given in the whole of the scripture. 1 Corinthians 13. It's significant that that chapter comes between two chapters discussing the gifts. And Paul actually says as he begins to talk about love, I show you a still better way, a still greater way. And so we see that the whole energy of the gifts, the whole purpose of the gifts is to move us towards being creatures that once again are filled with the pure love of heaven. In every thought, in every commitment, in every desire, in every action. So I end, I want to end by reading this from uh, the third chapter of Ephesians. We have expression there of this same point that I'm seeking to make. For this reason, Paul says, Ephesians 3, verse 14 and onward. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you, and here's the sentence, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. What a vision. His body filled up to all his fullness. That's the cumulative effect. That's where the gifts are to move us. We go a chapter later in Ephesians. Speaking the truth in love. Chapter 4 verse 15. Speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects. Unto him who is the head. Even Christ. From whom the whole body. 
being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So there it is, the cumulative effect. The individual gifts, not so important. We don't stand up and boast, well, I have this gift or I have that and mine's more impressive than yours. No, the exercise of the gifts, it's, it's forgotten, it's not focused on, it's not emphasized. It's happening. Each individual part is working and contributing. But all eyes are fixed upon the glory of what the Holy Spirit is doing, filling a connected community, a group of humans together. Filling them once again as a community. Filling them up with the love, the divine love, that is the, is the very fullness of God. Let's pray. Lord, you are astounding and amazing. You don't think like we do. You don't work like we do. You draw us into the task, broken, stumbling, often blind creatures who have been greatly damaged by the corruption of sin. And yet you call us on board. You say, here, I've got this for you to do. I've got this other for you to do. You give us tasks. You give us gifts, Lord. You draw us into your work. Lord, as a family here together in Porterville, oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit, plant this vision in us of a body set free from selfishness and self-preoccupation, weaknesses and fears and failings, Oh Lord, help us to see a body set free of these things. Filled. Filled with your spirit. Your compassion. Your mercy. Your love. Your patience. Your long suffering. Your care. Your infinite care. Oh Lord, fill us up in this way. Draw us forward on the pathway. That your heart might sing. And that we might know joy. The joy of being working together with you and seeing your goals come to pass. Oh Lord, grant us this, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Remember there's bread in the social hall. And Panera. And bread. <laughs>